about fungal biology amongst other things. So um, I'll hand over to her and I'll allow her to give you a proper introduction and a proper talking to about interesting things relating to fungi. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for asking me along this evening. And uh, I too acknowledge the traditional owners of, of the land we're standing on. And um, what I want to talk about is that, oh, about five years ago, we tried to get back into the university curriculum, a course on fungal biology. There had been a course many years ago, but the numbers were quite small and such is the way that the universities are run these days. Everything has to be run for, for money and economics and so small courses didn't survive. But I thought I sneaked it back in by putting it into the summer semester because it was a sort of a push to have more offerings available in the summer semester. And it, well, it turns out that there's actually very few offerings in science and certainly at a higher level in science, uh, the science faculty in the summer semester. So it actually, we found that it's attracted three types of people. It's attracted, fortunately, those people who really want to learn about fungi. It's also attracted people who want to fast track their degrees sometimes it's attracted people who have to quickly make up parts of their degree to finish and I think overall even if they might not come in with the right motive I think they finish with the right motive and <laughs> they seem to enjoy it so I don't know wait Wayne are you able to share the screen Certainly. so that um, that we can we can talk about so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the course to sort of say what's available. Uh, not that I'm necessarily doing it to advertise it, but, to, but more for the fact that because of, of the structure of it. What it's not, it's not about plant pathology. I'm a plant pathog pathologist. Um, oops, that's not mine. <laughs> I'm scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that one. <laughs> I'm a plant pathologist and um, that's basically I work and I teach I work in research um, diseases of banana for instance uh, but and I teach uh, plant pathology at both second and third level but what this course is not is not plant it's not plant pathology I wanted to keep that out of it I wanted to concentrate on fungal bi fungal biology in general so there was only one one topic where we cover plant pathogens for those who aren't as enlightened about them already. I snuck this picture in my, my daughter will, will, will be most, uh, I don't know, displeased. She actually gave me, she, this little drawing she did, that's what I wanted to put it in. But anyway, uh, so I've called the talk Forgotten Aspects of, of the Forgotten Kingdom, but um, I should say at least not well-known aspects because to some people they are well-known aspects and possibly to most of this audience they may be well-known and I should possibly waste my time telling you about them. <laughs> so, so Wayne, can you please move on? Sorry. Sorry. So just t t talking about the course, the target audience is uh, plant science students or science students or, or initially I, I suggested anyone could do it, but I realised that if you don't have a smattering of biology, it was going to be a little bit of a challenge, as I discovered in the first year. But OK, well, those with an interest in fungal biology and also the topics in it would be cross discipline. It would be traditional mycology, looking at industrial aspects of, of mycology, pharmaceuticals, medical and drug discovery uh, and the importance of fungi in the food and beverage industries, ecology, environmental aspects, and a little bit of plant and animal diseases. And it was quite interesting because, you know, I, I, when I taught a fungal biology course many years ago, I, I didn't go into, you know, really was just a, a side arm of plant pathology. But in doing this course, I sort of investigated a lot of areas that I'd never really appreciated before. So I just wanted to talk about some of these aspects. Some of you may well know it. Um, I did manage to get a grant from the university, a teaching grant, which did help a little bit because I was able to buy some camera equipment. Although having said that, it seems a bit superfluous now because my iPhone is 
takes better pictures than anything. I mean, you don't need to carry a big bag with you mm. anywhere. Uh, and I did manage to travel a little bit to, to interview some people. It was a bit of an excuse because I've got back to the UK where I originally come from and visited Edinburgh Botanic Gardens and spoke to the, um, the lichenologists there. And uh, I also visited Kew, which was quite interesting. So some of the images I, I did in, introduce um, into it, it was quite, at Kew, I was actually able to see a slide of the, the penicillium that Alexander Fleming had uh, looked at. So yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. But, so, um, uh, and, and I'm continually, as we'll t do, d dis uh, discuss, uh, it's because it's run in the summer semester, I knew nobody's going to turn up for lectures. Nobody turns up for lectures anyway. So, um, what it is, is all the topics that are in PowerPoint, I have voiced over. And so they're available, for, they're released weekly and the students can look at them there and uh, they look at the PDFs and they, they listen in. Uh, but I also have little video um, vignettes of interviews with people that are involved in these different aspects of fungal science, if you want to call it. So that this, this explains the format a bit and um, so 30 topics, um, two Pratt classes in early December and Nigel Fechner from the herbarium and Kayleen Bransgrove from the Plant Path herbarium come along to those and they, they, they're they very keen. I mean, the, and all they get for it is the free lunch, which they're very, <laughs> but I think they, they quite like the day of uh, escaping from the herbarium, I think. And, uh, and that's fantastic because, and the students come in and we just say, you know, go for it, you know, look down the microscope, and, you know, some and and discover fungi. And for those that have never done it before, that they're a little bit taken aback at first. And, um, and then when they realize it's all self-directed, but then they, they get quite into it. And, um, oh, Kayleen's joined. <laughs> I was just talking about you, Kayleen. <laughs> oh, we love the day off. <laughs> so, and, uh, And, uh, and, and then on the January, we have another two days of prax, and then Rod Rogers comes along and we talk about lichens. So it's fantastic to get all their knowledge and to, you know, and the students, you know, by then they, they realize that they quite like this free format, you know, they can be in the lab for as long as they want uh, throughout the working day. And they have to, at the end of it, submit what I call virtual herbarium sheets so that they, they put it all together and they describe two or, or four samples of whatever it is that they've done over those prac classes and they go into details with it. So, so that works out quite well, I think, in regards. And there's little quizzes and of course there's an exam. But I, what I wanted to talk about, <laughs> this is our signal. Oh yes, the books. Um, the resources, obviously there's lots of resources on the web, but one particular book that I found terribly useful was this one, Watkinson uh, et al, with Lynn Body and um, I think it's Nicholas Money. And um, it's a very useful book, very useful textbook. It's actually in UQ library, it's available online. Uh, and uh, I, I actually went to a mycology congress, uh, oh, must be three or four years ago, and I met Lynn Body. And she was so excited, she's a wonderful lady. She was so excited that somebody was actually offering a course in fungal biology because there's been a real dearth of those courses being offered, not just in Australia, not just in Europe, but sort of worldwide. So, it, and I actually gave a presentation there say, saying that we'd reintroduced a course. And I feel it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple course. There's no big deal, but uh, it's just that there's very few courses on just purely on fungal biology, which is like sad. And then the other book I, I suggest they read is, um, George Hudler visited us, uh, he did a sabbatical with us a few years ago and he, he was right, he was doing an update of his book, Magical Mushrooms, Mischievous Molds. And he actually inspired me to run the course because he's that Cornell, well was, he's retired now. And he offered this course 
without the PRAC aspect, a course on fungal biology, I should say, without the PRAC aspect. And he said that he was getting about two or three hundred students. Mm. I'm not getting that. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but um, I think a lot of the medical students that they have to do some other things before they actually start doing medicine. So I think you've got a lot of those types of students doing it. But it, it's worth it. If you haven't read it, it's worth it. It's good. It's a more, um, it's quite an easy read, that uh, George's book. So, so I suggest that they look at that one too. And then, of course, there's the video interviews. To miss the scene. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> right. And so this is just the, the, the topics. I just I thought you'd be interested to see how, how we've covered it. So that first of all, and that, look, I start with basidios because I've always learned that with uh, teaching when I, you know, because I even start my plant pathology courses with the sort of systematics. But I never start with the lower kingdom, the lower order of fungi because they're so boring and you switch people off and you don't want them to withdraw from the course. <laughs> so, 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 so I always start with the basidios because I think it's a little bit more interesting and then just work the way through it and I talk about herbaria and, and collections because I think that's obviously very important and then we go through various aspects and then the break you know basically the first 15 topics are before Christmas and the, the other 15 are after Christmas um, and various aspects like that uh, and it's probably more you know the, the first panel was probably what I was more familiar with and maybe some of the molecular aspects, but some of the sort of fermentation processes, antibiotics and stuff, I, I certainly did learn a lot in putting it all together. And I'm, I'm still looking, I would rather, because actually one of the topics Diana gave, the, gave the, uh, um, when she was talking about the um, animal pathogens and stuff, and so, so, so Diana gave that one. And uh, Vic Galeer also have used a lot of his stuff with them. Um, and biocontrol and things like that. So maybe we can go on to, because otherwise I'll be talking here all night. Um, just, oh, and you'll just keep clicking through Wayne. Sorry, I didn't realize I didn't have a, wouldn't have a clicker. So this is just examples of the, the different people we spoke to that just keep, just keep clicking, it'll fill up eventually. <laughs> um, all the different people that we have video, did videos with a timber specialist, Leslie, oh gosh, I can't remember her surname, from the uh, Queensland Department of, I think she must be with environmental science, and a biotechnologist at, on the university who works, looks at, at pigment production using fermentation processes. And um, lots of the plant pathologists, uh, obviously, lichenologists, um, uh, animal scientists, <coughs> and, um, all these various things and even we, we've got a food scientist to talk about cell wall digestion even though she didn't work with cell wall, um, fungi but it's more that it's so important in knowing what fungi do to know the construct of the cell wall and uh, the plant cell wall that is of course and uh, so so it was it's quite nice and I'm still getting people involved uh, to try and do some more videos with it so I, I think seems to be that's how students like to learn these days in these little videos that come in uh, so um, and that's just you know the prac classes i think i've more or less covered that and um, this is me showing off my iphone <laughs> uh, this was this was lovely one uh, this is down at redlands i, I have a plot of bananas down there at the uh, um, daf uh, field station there and this fungus it, it's always at the same spot there must have been some there's no trees there at that particular spot anymore but they're quite distant but there must have been something there before it's always they have fantastic puffballs come up at the same spot as as this one so um but this was you know so that's how it used these nice pictures so next so the highlights I just wanted to talk about, which I found some interesting facts, were, which weren't plant pathogens and not necessarily intriguing fruiting bodies, which possibly you're more used to. So I'm not really going to talk about that. But um, uh, so if we move on, please. So one aspect, so I introduced the students, how do fungi obtain nutrients? And I, I know, 
you people will know most of these things, but just to sort of, you know, categorize what I'm going to talk about. Um, as mutualistic symbionts, we talk about mycorrhizae, <clears throat> both endo and ecto, and about lichens, and then saprophytes, and then as pathogens. And so we discuss this uh, in the course as we go through. And perhaps if we move to the next one. So with um, ectomycorrhizal partners, um, you know, explain to them about the, the plant symbiont that, that 3% of plant species are have ectomycorrhizal uh, relationships. And I guess wh where you people are concerned, that's probably something that you find that a lot of this grouping is most interesting because they produce these wonderful fruiting bodies. And obviously you find them in temperate and boreal forest trees. The fungal symbionts, um, you know, include species within the basidiomycota and the ascomycota. So next, please. No, nope, it's okay. So, so what, what, what I wanted to, um, ex you know, what explained that the, the trees benefit by the increased roof surface area, and then it's it's that um, increase in mineral uptakes that that, that fungi allowed um, that benefit the plant by by taking phosphates because they can be sh stored in the, the fungal sheath ar around the roots and things. I, I feel embarrassed. I'm sure you people know a lot of this stuff. So just tell me to, to move on quickly if, if you're getting bored. Uh, and then the, the, all these sort of things. So we might move on to the next one. So, there you go. Yeah, right. There, this was the thing that ectomycorrhizal symbiosis has arisen at least 10 times within the fungal kingdom. And I thought that that was something, well, well, sorry, I hadn't known before. <laughs> and uh, uh, and that you can see this reflected in the different type of, of mycorrhizal um, roots that form in these associations. Mm -hmm. So with some of them, you can see these extent, extensive mycelial cords. In others, the, the, there's more of a sheath. And this one down here, this bristling melanized hyphae. And, and that reflects the, 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 where they, you know, the different aspects of, the, of how the mycorrhization occurred uh, within different um, plagues within the fungal kingdom. And, and I think that, I thought that was something quite interesting because I think up till then everybody just assumed what oh, just happened and it was all from the one evolutionary um, um, event. And this happened about 100 million years ago when the gymnosperms and angiosperms diverged. So I thought, I thought that was one of, that's one of my interesting unknown facts. Yeah. Uh, and if we move on to the next one, where we're talking about arbuscal mycorrhizae or endomycorrhizae, they're, they're of course a much more ancient uh, grouping and a much more well, considerably more, supposedly more primitive fungi within the glomerulomycota. No, the interesting thing is that in the fossil records, these fungi are co-evolved with their host and they actually predate vascular plants. And of course, some theories say that it's, it was those endomycorrhizal fungi in the association with aquatic plants that allowed them to move onto the land because obviously they didn't have, have, have roots. Um, and uh, so, so I thought, yes, there's another interesting fact that not that many people know about fungi. So please move on if we can. Oh, the, and that was just, oh, it, was, it was an interesting paper of uh, just sort of going through what um, the endomycorrhizal interaction looks like on, on plant roots. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, the spore, as you probably know, endomycorrhizae fungi can't be cultured, but the spores, you can, the spores are relatively big and you can filter through soil where, they, where they've been um, associated, particularly apparently lupins are quite good. And so 90% of, of plants have mycorrhizal associations. M many of our crop plants probably don't because we're filling them with, with nutrients, but if they were growing in natural environments, they'd probably require that association. Even still, um, cotton, for instance, still needs a mycorrhizal association, even though the nutrients are applied in the crop. So um, incredibly important things and, and, and 
very much overlooked in uh, a lot of what we do and even in agriculture. So the, um, if we move on, uh, yes. So the difference is that unlike the ectomycorrhizae that change the, the, the physical appearance of the plant root, the endomycorrhizae you can't see because everything is going on inside. And those little wafts of hyphae that extend out from the plant are very fine and they're going out and with their, because they've got their are fine, they're able to get into smaller nooks and crannies in the soil and to glean the, the, the minerals, the phosphates and et cetera from the plant, uh, from the soil and, uh, and the water and send it all back to the plant and they get that exchange of carbohydrates, obviously. If we move on to the next slide. But the, uh, the thing that I st then started looking at was that the, the very important fact that, that, that they have in the interaction in the soil in, in, um, in maintaining carbon in the soil. <clears throat> and they produce this glycoprotein called globinin, which actually uh, helps to bind the soil particles with the fungi. And if you, uh, and there was this, I took it from this paper from um, somebody from the University of Illinois, and um, they actually took soil and they extracted the glomalin. And after you look at what's left, it's very much just the actual physical structure of soil without uh, any of the, the, the debris and the humus and the humus that's left behind. So you can see what, how it's, it's quite important in maintaining soil carbon. And if, if what, just to, I think it, there's a, 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 images I've taken from those papers, it just shows you, <clears throat> yeah, for instance, uh, how they aggregates, illustrates how it, it, it clings on to the, the bits of, um, Oh, you could say detritus in the soil and everything and holds on to it. And, and this um, image there, I can't, oh gosh, there, there was just a, a fluorescent image showing the, the, the endomycorrhizae around the roots of a plant. And you can see the spores and how the hyphae are extending out from it. So it perme permeates the organic matter and it binds it to, to the silt and sand and clay. And it, it's suggested from this paper, I don't know if it's an overestimation, and, uh, but up to 27% of total soil carbon is bound out and glomalin. So it's really important, and it's really important that we main, uh, allow the mycorrhizal to maintain in the soils if we're going to make sure we're not releasing any more carbon to the atmosphere. And if we move on to the next slide, please. We'll get there. Um, all right, so I think I've more or less covered that one. Uh, uh, the, the importance then comes in, and I know um, um, Graham can talk about this uh, topic quite, uh, to le quite lengthily, but um, when we go through, when we, when the farmer, whoever, goes through and tills the soil, you're actually reducing those mycorrhizal associations, you're breaking that down. Now, I find that, awkward because as a plant pathologist uh, I always find it's when you don't till you get that build up of pathogens on the surface <laughs> but but also you you if you do, I guess if you leave it long enough you get the antagonists there yeah. to the plant pathogens too so but it, it's always um, this balance and obviously tilling is is important not minimal tilling is important with uh, and water retention as well but it's 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 important to you know so that was something else that you know we brought up in the course that uh, how we can be very destructive of of these mycorrhizal associations and and it might look at like a, a very a, the impact it then has on releasing carbon is, is quite hard so if we can move on to the next one so then I think I moved on to the saprophytes. So if we move on, uh, and we talked about the types of rotters, um, the white rotters, and oops, move quickly. No worries. The white rotters and the, the brown rotters. Um, and obviously, you know, we're all familiar with that, that the white rotters break down, degrade the lignin to access the cellulose and hemicellulose. And uh, whereas the, the brown rotters, are can only sneak they can sneak in and get the cellulose and just leave the lignin behind so that's why you've got the main differences 
But the important thing was with the white rot is because they can degrade lignin. Now, lignin is a very complex polymer. It's made up of three alcohol precursors and it all sort of, it forms together as in a sort of, um, not in a regular pattern, whereas cellulose, which is the other main structural component of, of plant cell walls, is very regular. And it's a very regular glucose monomers, which uh, are all in long chains of polymers. And so that um, the fungi that can break down cellulose, you know, usually do it by three successive types of enzymes that are just breaking up the bonds of the monomers. But to break up lignin is very complex. It's, it actually explodes it. You know, the, these lacases and peroxidases actually go in and explode, explode the, the polymer apart. Mm -hmm. Audio is poor. No, no, no. I, is that me? No? <laughs> just, that's okay. I just speak really Right. Okay. okay. And uh, so, so, but the interesting thing is that we can make use of these white rock fungi, not uh, for, for various anything, other things because they are able to break down phenolic compounds. So if we move on to the next slide, hopefully, if I remember the order. That, uh, so white rock fungi uh, are used um, by, you can apply them in liquid culture to contaminated soils uh, um, as the mycelia will grow over wood chips, et cetera, and they can be plowed in and they can break down some of those horrible chlorinated compounds or poly, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like, such as benzene and things. Some of these um, and halogenated compounds, I'm sure that's the sort of thing they used up on some of the air bases and things that cause such a problem. That fungi, uh, uh, these white rock fungi, which are big, capable of degrading lignin, are also capable of degrading some of these more uh, obnoxious um, compounds in our industrialized society. So, uh, so there's another interesting fact about fungi. So if we move on, I'll see what we've got. And then citric acid. Now I love this one. I, I, every, and all the second year students always get this one. What's citric acid got to do with fungi? Uh, <laughs> I presume you know. <laughs> citric acid used in a wide variety of industrial processes. I mean, you just need to to look at the bottle, of, you know, a shampoo bottle or a, or a, or some flavoring in your kitchen cupboard or or a soft drink, um, you know, where you've got this um, lime lemon flavored juice or whatever it is. Cleaning agents. They've all got citric acid, and they didn't come from some lovely orchard where the you know where the, the lemon trees were growing and the, the bees were buzzing around. They came from an industrial fermentation process, and so and it's um, so seventy percent uh, is used in the food industry, and then you've got things using uh, reduces phenol oxidation. I mean, citric acid is um, is used in cheese production, cosmetics, etc., and this ugly looking fungus here is the fungus that most of the citric acid comes from. Not because uh, um, if we move on to the next slide, we will see that it was um, a consequence of the First World War that Pfizer, and Pfizer seems to be, everyone knows about Pfizer these days. Uh, Pfizer had obtained the citric acid originally from purifying citrus from fruits obtained in Italy, but during the Sorry, there's lots of animations in this one. During the First World War, that, um, obviously they, it wasn't very, it was pretty risky trying to get lemons from Italy and crossing the Atlantic. So they looked to some other processes. So they started up a fermentation process using bread mold and sugar in Brooklyn in the 1920s. And that's what the original fermentation vats looked like. And if we move on, um, so this was the first of the submerged mycelial fermentation processes. Mm -hmm. And they used, uh, sorry, a little bit of biochemistry, uh, but just to know, we've got to remember all this before. <laughs> <laughs> just to, to, to say that citric acid is a very basic product in, in all, you know, all of our cells. It's in the part of the TCA cycle. Um, obviously Wayne doesn't like his biochemistry. <laughs> 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 and, um, but by manipulating the, the cycle in this continuous fermentation process, you can start to accumulate um, citric uh, 
where we see the citric there, we can start to accumulate citric acid uh, by, by when it becomes nutrient deficient and growth is limited. So that, that's how they were able to do that. And so they had that technology well developed in the 1920s. Now, why I mentioned, you know, obviously it's important and citric acid to this day it's still produced, but obviously a little bit more sophisticated fermentation that, that's. But why I mention it, if we move on to the next slide, Ooh. is Fleming, sorry, it's a bit, uh, um, observations back in 1928. Now he, which you are all familiar with, um, if we just move through the, the, the animation, sorry, yeah, I'm going, um, there he is, a good Scotsman, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We brought, and that's the first that you know. We I remember having a hit book, you know, when it was quite early on. It was all about all Scottish inventors, you know. It was so parochial, <laughs> but uh, you know they listed that. But he he obviously made his observation against the you know seeing that the penicillin in the culture plate was inhibiting the stuff of crocus. And if we move on, we will see that um, that. As I mentioned before, uh, at Q in the herbarium, in the mycology herbarium at Q, they actually have the original slides there with, with the fungus there. It was, you know, uh, I did feel a bit nerdy when I got so excited about it. But <laughs> it was lovely seeing that. Are they the original Alexander Fleming slides? Yes, yes. Wow. So they're in a cab there. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't get it out and look at them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was, it was great. So, um, so anyway, we, we now know that it was the, the penicillin within the, that culture plate. But the thing is that you have a, that culture is not going to do anything. You, it, no way would you ever get a sufficient amount of penicillin being produced from, you know, the culture that Fleming uh, first noted uh, to be effective get in a pharmaceutical setting. So we move on. So there was a big race. Um, oh, sorry, next slide. Oh, okay. How to go from the culture plate phenomenon to a wide scale production of antibiotics. And some of you may have seen this a pretty good movie. It was an Australian movie because obviously this Australian got involved in the story. It was Flory, of course. And uh, so, you know, he he was one of the team that made that instigated the movement from the culture plate into uh, antibiotic production. So if we just flick through this. We've got this um, guy and. Um, Ernest Chain who followed up in Fleming's publication, Flory conducted clinical trials. A guy called Heatley purified the penicillin. And, and then they used large numbers of bedpans as surface fermentation methods to obtain the quantities. And much of this was carried out in Oxford. And then they developed a process to remove the impurities. So all the time they were getting there and refining it, but there still wasn't enough for the first basic um, human trial. Uh, and if we move on a bit, and of course, then um, World War II came along and th there was a real great need for antibiotics because, I mean, I, I st you know, it's still it's amazing to think what the world would have been like without mm -hmm. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. You know, even a simple scratch, you know, would have could have led to, you know, dire consequences. So if we move on to the next slide, <clears throat> in step, um, penicillin production shifted to the USA. And do anyone know why I've got the cantaloupe there? Yeah, yeah. because uh, that if we move on, uh, sorry. So Pfizer, again, used, this, really used the citric acid fermentation process and did the same thing, but did it with penicillium to, uh, and then, but they needed a strain that was adapted to submerged culture. And they found it on this cantaloupe in uh, Mellon in a local market in Illinois. And that became, it was quite a good one for that they were able to, but obviously still even then it wasn't fantastic amounts of production, but they, with constant mutations, inducing constant mutations over time and selecting for individual strains that would produce higher levels of penicillin, they, they got to the point where they could produce it at um, sufficient levels that they could start using it in trials and then applying it and the costs went down from crazy amounts so um once again Pfizer <laughs> comes comes to the rescue okay 
So, and when anybody thinks of fungi being associated with pharmaceuticals, they think of antibiotics, but they don't necessarily think of other things. And I, and I, I feel very embarrassed that I didn't realize this, uh, that the cholesterol um, and pharmaceuticals, the statins, are all based on a fungal process, that um, the synthesis of cholesterol is complex and takes many steps. And it's important in the construction of membranes in mammalian or animal cells, but not in plant cells. However, in fungal cells, ergosterols, which are very similar to cholesterol, is a similar, have a similar function and a similar pathway. And if we move on to the next slide, we can see that the, the interesting thing is that the green arrow points to where plants are in a phylogenetic tree. The red arrow points to where animals are, and the next arrow <laughs> points to where fungi are. So fungi are much more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And consequent, I mean, and that's often the reason why it's difficult to use an antifungal compound to get rid of your athlete's foot, because, you know, as well as an antibiotic, you know, <laughs> bacterial, totally distantly related. Uh, so it's, it's using a parallel system, but it was quite, feasible and the chap that did, looked at this a lot was uh, I think no oh, I haven't got so it must be the next slide was Dr. Endo Akira uh, Akira Endo from Japan and he was a real student of um, Fleming he he was very impressed with Fleming and Flory's work and on how they they managed to produce penicillin that he he was quite convinced that we could do something against cholesterol using fungal systems and so he assessed three well four thousand effectively strains of fungi uh, to look for inhibitory effects in this pathway so this pathway that um, if the previous slide uh, they don't worry don't bother changing it if but well we see that the the rate limiting step from in, in the production of mevalonate, I'm not biochemist, so please excuse me, it was the enzymes, the HMG-CoA enzyme, reductase enzyme, was um, allows that pathway to happen and then you get the buildup of cholesterol. So it became a target to try and manipulate that enzyme so you could lower the cholesterol levels. So by, if we go on to the next slide, by looking at a similar system in fungi, um, we see that there's a similar enzyme. So if we can compare that, and, and that's exactly what uh, uh, Dr. Endo did, and he looked at, and there were other groups started to look at it as well. And so if we move on, and they found that the, um, an, a product in Aspergillus terris, a mevalin, uh, a compound, and also monolin came in, and it was later changed to, because they were all competing and publishing at the same time putting in patents at the same time, I should say. It was later called lovastatin, and it showed that lovastatin raised the LPD uh, receptor levels in the kidney and then the liver and led to a reduction in the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterols in the bloodstream. And from that, we move on and we see that we've got statins and, and lower statins found, it's also found in oyster mushrooms, uh, in red yeast, red yeast rice, uh, which has been fermented with monascus species. And, um, and it possibly is, occurs in these fungi because it's actually inhibiting that enzyme in competitors. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's evolved as a protection from the fungi, from other fungi to try and break down the membranes or the formation of membranes in their cells. So it's, uh, it's, it's important, but if we look to the next slide, we see that that uh, became, is one of them, because it's a thing that people have to take it again and again and again, that's what pharmaceutical companies love. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it became Libitor is, is a synthetic, but which they, because they were able to then develop a synthesized version of these, but using the basis of the fungal enzymes that have been produced, is the best selling pharmaceutical of all time. Mm -hmm. So it's just crazy that, that these things. So we'll move on. I'm not, I'll, probably, I'll probably skip through these, but just to be aware of how many other fungi 
are involved in pharmaceuticals. It's not just antibiotics, it's not just statins, it involves immunos um, um, antidepressants as well. I can't remember which one it was that was involved in that. Claviceps purpurea, which some of you would probably know the stories well off but that, that causes ergot in, in particularly in rye and in other grains. Uh, it produces a whole cocktail of alkaloids uh, which have been associated with them. Um, witchcraft and everything in the Middle Ages when people consumed the contaminated wheat and, and also with gangrene with uh, St. Anthony's fire where your limbs fell off and stuff like that because of these horrible alkaloids and also with um, LSD and all the weird trials that went on with that in the middle of the 20th century. So, um, so but having said that, there's still a lot of uh, benefits that the anti-migraine anti uh, compounds because of the being vaso um, constrictors that they can be quite effective in migraine treatment, etc. So just to highlight them, so we'll just move. And in some cases, apparently using fungal fermentation with the fungus is still better than the synthetics that have been adapted from it. So they're still doing that. Uh, we move on. And then fungal enzymes. Uh, oh, we're doing with time. I'll find speed up a bit. Um, <clears throat> this is again a, an area that I wasn't aware of that um, mo many of these enzymes that are used 60% uh, in, in our enzymes are produced oh, sorry 5 billion US dollars a year industry produces enzymes by fermentation process of which 60% of that is by filamentous fungi and so it's, it's a huge area and uh, these are things that go, go in ahead in quiet warehouses that none of us are really, well, I'm certainly not aware of. Uh, and there's over 100 enzymes produced across 25 different genera of fungi. Much of it's from Aspergillus, but some from Rhizopus, some from using Trichoderma, others from Penicillium, uh, and some even Abyssidio homeocola, which I'm not familiar with. Um, so, um, and the types of enzymes that are produced and are utilized in industrial processes uh, when we move, please, are things like enzymes involved in laundry detergents. So when you talk about your biological laundry detergents, you, know, you just well, you buy it, you think, oh, biological, how is it biological? And just use it. Um, it actually contains um, lipases and cellulases that are derived from fungal origin. Uh, so, and it makes sense, and it just it makes you worry about, you know, not to wash your clothes too much because each time you're using cellulose, you're using enzymes to break down the cellulose fibers to release the dirt. So each time, I mean, it's like, it's like this faded gene thing. That, I mean, apparently they're treated with trichoderma because it, it has ability to break down cellulose and you're, you're buying a product that's already degraded, I thought. Get it, get it. But um, and then there's there's one the ones which are, are adapted to, to higher environments like although is this Thermomyces languinosus, uh, which is an asexual uh, ascomycrobe to obtain from the soil, uh, and it it has uh, both cellulases and uh, lipases. But because it's, it's thermophilic, it's able to survive warmer temperatures. So you can use your biological washing powder at 60 degrees as opposed to uh, lower temperatures. And it's still effective in breaking down these things. So, so I, I, I found that, that, was, that was amazing. I didn't realize that. Uh, and then, and similarly with toothpaste and chewing gum, they have uh, enzymes that produce from, from fungi. Um, glucose oxidase is, uh, uh, which leads to generation of hydrogen peroxide in your mouth to clean your, to bleach your teeth, uh, or lacases that, that are obtained from, um, that break down the, the sulfides and the bad breath stuff in chewing gum. So, um, and that, that's coming from trivitis, you know, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and then, so we move on, I think we're getting to near the end. <laughs> Other useful uses, obviously in the paper industry, in leathers, uh, in forest productions and all these. And so we maybe go through an animal feed stuff. Xylanases and beta-glucanases are used to, to sort of pre-digest some of the, the more, um, in the, you know, grains, et cetera, to make it easier for the 
the pigs except chickens or whatever to to feed on and phytases uh, that can break down some of the plant material <clears throat> making it more available for non-ruminant animals and um, and then we've got oh right so changing tax the po point of uh, direct influence of climate change that how the fungi are involved with that and these are data that you may have been aware of that in Europe, we see that the days to fruiting of certain basidial mycota has got shorter and shorter and shorter as the climate gets warmer and warmer. So that they're having a huge impact in, 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 on fungal fruiting bodies, et cetera. And this also has an implication for increased decomposition activity. So reflecting that is with more decomposition. So when it ceases to be in balance with what's been produced through uh, photosynthesis and being locked up in carbon, then you've got increased decomposition. Again, you've got more carbon being released to the environment. So these things all impact it. And if we move on, uh, and yeah, be balanced by the increase, but however, the issue is that uh, we have, yeah, no, sorry, we'll skip this one, just move on to the next one. The big issue we have in the Arctic tundra is that with increasing temperature, but still the same amount of daylight, you don't get the corresponding photosynthesis, increase in photosynthesis matching the, the increased uh, decomposition of the Arctic tundra where the ice is melting, et cetera. And that's leading to you know, crazy, crazy goings on uh, that um, seem to be getting out of, out of control. Okay, so just to finish off, fungi, the largest living organism on earth, you know, the Amalaria ostoia, I think it's called, uh, pathogen on coniferous trees in, I think it was in Canada, extends from one tree to another by rhizomorph and by doing molecular analysis and looking at, because obviously, you know, because of the basidios, you know, going through um, producing new genotypes every time they were able to establish that one single genotype was, uh, had spread over a 9.6 kilometer square uh, area. So yeah, the largest living organism on earth. Next one, oops, back one. Fastest living organism on earth. If you look at some of the YouTube clips of Pylobus, the hat thrower, you can see how it's, it's been pushed. I mean, I, I, I'm not very sure if it really is the fastest thing, but uh, how it's been pushed up um, off from its, its base um, as, it, as it explodes, that little valve sort of thing explodes below it and it gets pushed off from one cow dung pat mm -hmm. to another one at an exposure. And there's a little YouTube video where you can see the guys actually timed timed at the speed of it. So the fastest living thing on the earth and also <clears throat> mysteri mysterious hidden allies that we're finding mm -hmm. as a, and, and particularly in, in our area, we're finding that every plant you look at has fungal endophytes. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, they first became apparent through tissue culture because they're a bit of a nuisance because they, they move in, some of them move into the, the media where you're trying to culture the, the plants in. But, uh, the, they've evolved alongside the plants. We, we suspect some cases are beneficial uh, and most cases probably beneficial to the plants, but uh, that they're there all the time. It's not just pathogens that attack plants mm -hmm. and they promote growth. So some of the largely unknown aspects of, of fungi, we can flick through this. And so just uh, all the, these, some of these things and, the, and there's more, and there's more. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just I just thought I'd sort of maybe mention some of these things. Oh, and cows, and if we go on to the last slide, the last one, cows have fungal partners too. So even anaerobic chytrids are in the guts of, of herbivores. So we find fungi everywhere. And uh, so it's, they're, they're not just pretty fruiting. Oh, sorry. I, I, forget about those ones, I've, fi I've finished now. <laughs> they're not just pretty fruiting bodies, uh, they're not just plant pathogens, they're, they're absolutely, as I say, they're essential for our, our biosphere, uh, but they also have incredible useful uh, properties that we use in industrial processes as well and pharmaceuticals. So I hope that was okay, is that where you wanted? <laughs> <laughs>
One question I, I did have for you is, uh, I, I think I might have mentioned to you through email, was that we get, we get this question quite frequently, and it is, if I want to be a mycologist, what do I study? Um, are you able to succinctly well, answer that question? I, I'll so, ask you what, question what, what would be my what is the study course if I want to be a mycologist? What is a mycologist? You know, what what, what do you see as being a mycologist? Do you see it being a mycologist as looking at pretty, a very attractive fruiting bodies, uh, or do you see it as applying? fungal biology to some of the things I mentioned before. I know at the University of Adelaide, they're very interested, and that's something I, we didn't mention here today either, is uh, clinical mycology. It's a very important uh, aspect, but particularly you know, immunosuppressed people get horrible fungal infections. And in fact, their, their uh, website is really good for, for microfungi because they've got a website of, you know, it's obviously aimed at doctors, trying to identify uh, various uh, fungal structures. So I guess if you're, a, you know, you could be somebody who studies clinical mycology, uh, and obviously I presume in most cases they would go through medicine, but um, I, there are a few universities that would uh, think, uh, I always get, forget the name of that one in the States, uh, that, that Vigalis is at. Can you remember what it's? It's um, Rutgers. Is it Rutgers? Or oh, I don't know. I can't remember one. So there's a few departments of my fungal biology left in the world, but not many. I think most people who do and mycology is taught mostly where it is taught is in plant science departments or botany departments, mm. uh, which seems a bit odd, given that I said they're closer to animals. Uh, but I guess you know. In the 19th century they probably thought there were plants mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so how do you study I mean I'm a plant pathologist uh, I study fungal plant pathogens uh, and most plant pathologists ignore Graham <laughs> most of them are fungal plant pathologists there's a few virologists there's um, some bacteriologists and there's even fewer nematologists but <laughs> but um, yeah, I, uh, I'm not quite sure how you become a mycologist. I think you, you, get, you, do, you study at some point, but then you become a specialist, you, you do the research, and if, if that's the way you want to get into the research. I should ask Nigel, I don't know how he got there, actually. I mean, it's interesting, I've never really, uh, I think he did his undergraduate at UQ. And, um, but- um, It's probably an overseas. Question yeah, yeah. With a complex answer, yeah, that's yes. not easily answered. But it is. It, I it's mean, a question I, we often get. Yeah, there. but that, I guess that's the thing. I mean, we've talked about how many different industries and 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 areas that fungi come into, mm -hmm. and I guess that makes it difficult to be a mycologist because you you can't possibly know across all those things. Not your one size yeah, fits all. yeah, and uh, you know you could be. Uh, a chemical engineer and be using fungi every day in your life and you probably wouldn't even you know be able to identify a, a fungal species but uh, yeah so it's it's yeah it's tricky they're they're everywhere yeah. any other questions so liz is this the is this the only entry level <laughs> mycology um program that's often uh, unit that's often i'll need to reiterate the question yeah. right so is this, and the question was, was this the only entry level mycology uh, unit that's offered at UQ? Yeah. Yes, the, the standalone mycology one. Uh, it's, um, I know I have colleagues that teach in uh, School of, of Chemistry and Molecular Biology, mm -hmm. and they talk a little bit about fermentation science and, um, and um, uh, clinical mycology. I obviously, we in, have it in plant pathology. Uh, and, to, and we also have it in when we're talking about molecular plant interactions, because uh, there's a lot going on in the plant pathology area in that area. But this is the only standalone mycology subject. We have actually, we've got few people doing cross institutional studies in this. So we've got few folk from Southern Cross, if, if they can get across the border. Uh, to taking it on uh, this coming summer semester. Yeah. Wonderful.
Thank you very much, right, Elizabeth. No worries. Thank you.